Helena Sims and Croissant Babe shared their insights about marine spatial planning and the blue economy here in the Republic of Seychelles. The Seychelles Marine Spatial Plan is an output of the world's first debt restructuring for ocean conservation and climate adaptation. It is a stakeholder-driven process that's led by the government of Seychelles and facilitated by the Nature Conservancy. And what we are doing is we're allocating and analyzing spatial distribution and use across the entire exclusive economic zone of the Seychelles to achieve three specific objectives. The first one is to identify 30% of the exclusive economic zone for marine protections. The second is to address climate change adaptation. And the third is to push forward the blue economy strategy of the Seychelles. The blue economy for Seychelles is, uh, is uh, a multi-sectoral development that involves the participation of civil society, public sector, and private sector as well. And it has three main components. The first component is um, uh, the economic diversification or the sharing of prosperity which focuses on development or reinforcement of existing sectors such as fisheries, tourism and port development and it also focuses on the exploration of new and emerging sectors. So this is the first pillar of the blue economy. The second pillar is about the development of our community, the social development of our uh, people within our community, the creation of um, job opportunities, creation of um, entrepreneurship development uh, opportunities for the youth. And the third pillar focuses a lot on preservation and conservation. So the MSP brings together all these three components in harmony. MSP brings a dialogue um, between the key stakeholders or the key users of the oceans and together. And um, it reduces the pressure of human activities upon the ocean resources and, and the uh, marine ecosystem. We've had engagement from representatives from over 11 marine sectors. Everyone in Seychelles had a voice and was welcome to participate in the process. We've had over 200 meetings to agree on not only the areas to be protected, but also the conditions, the management conditions and the allowable activities in these areas. We avoid as much as possible um, displacement of existing users because we need to support the pillars of the economy of Seychelles, fisheries and tourism sectors. Right now, the users of the ocean know where the high priority areas are, where activities on the ocean are to be done or conduct conducted, how and to what extent. So we are experiencing um, 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 the reduction in conflicts and um, uh, the reductions of um, uh, human pressure upon the ocean. Seychelles met the 30% uh, biodiversity conservation goal um, in March of 2020 with the gazetting of 13 new marine protection areas, which total just over 400,000 square kilometers. This target of 30% was both by area, but also by species and habitat representation. By meeting this objective, we've met the UN Sustainable Development Goals, but also the High Ambition Coalition Goals of 30 by 30, so 30% 30 protection by 2030. Once the Marine Spatial Plan is completed, it will also be the first in the Western Indian Ocean and the second largest in the world. We explored how our global community can utilize marine spatial planning to uplift ocean rights. We asked, does good governance and protection enable ocean rights? And how does good governance support the restoration of ocean health, help facilitate a thriving blue economy, and prepare us all for the inclement impacts of climate change? So Didier, let's begin with you. You're involved, or you were involved, in the initiation of the debt swap, which eventually led to the Marine Spatial Plan. Can you share a little bit more details about how this all came about? The debt swap came about uh, back in 2012 when Seychelles was um, exploring ways to raise financing and scale up at least the amount of funds that we had to finance a number of initiatives that had to do with conservation and also adaptation to climate change. And we clearly did not have enough money and Ambassador Jumeau at that time was um, talking to the TNC, the Nature Conservancy, and, um, and the depth swap was brought to the cabinet and at that time, and we discussed it, and we found that it was a potential 
um, vehicle for us to um, raise financing. So at uh, Rio Plus 20 in, uh, in June 2012, President Ford, who was the vice president at the time, made a pledge at a GLISPA event um, that Seychelles was prepared to protect 30% of its um, EEZ if we could raise um, about two million US dollars per year for us to be able to invest um, in conservation and also adapt, um, climate change adaptation. So that was the beginning of it. And it was a process of learning by doing because nobody had done it before. We were the first. And eventually we stumbled on marine special planning because we did not have a tool for us to, able, to be able to determine exactly what areas were to be protected, which areas would be for sustainable use and, and other uses. So we, we had to come up with a new uh, methodology for us to, to be able to determine these things. It was a very exciting time of discovery and inventing new things. Ms. Helena, I'd like to move on with you. Thank you so much, Didier. Uh, what do you feel are some of the biggest lessons learned and successes from your experience of being a part of the Seychelles Marine Spatial Plan initiative? I think, uh, you know, as Didier mentioned, there's kind of a domino effect of all these other things coming about from that initiation. Um, what were your lessons learned? So when the MSP started in 2014, um, we looked at the lessons learned from that history of conservation um, in Seychelles. And some of those basic principles were applied to the Seychelles Marine Spatial Plan because of the local context, so adopting the precautionary principle, using a science-based um, management um, and adaptation um, process, and including, for example, sector-based management um, in the Seychelles. And then added to that, looking at other countries and how they have gone about their marine spatial planning, um, Australia, Europe, and so on, and adapting that to a small island developing state uh, concept. Now, um, eight years later, um, we have also documented the lessons learned from the Marine Spatial Plan Initiative itself. It's actually published in the Commonwealth Blue Charter as a case study. And some of the key lessons include um, um, ensuring um, equity so all stakeholders from all um, uh, communities and marine sectors have equal opportunity to contribute to the discussion, to the planning process. Um, other key lessons learned include um, for example, allowing time uh, for the process. We just mentioned um, five years of planning. So um, being able, for example, to um, uh, have a data repository, we have used, um, uh, we have over 100 uh, data layers in a spatial data catalog for the marine spatial plan and the re repository being the Ministry for Environment. Uh, so having time to collect all the data having very clear milestones and a phased approach throughout the process so all uh, stakeholders are clear on what the objectives are and what we are planning for. And then finally, um, having very clear champions um, uh, to, to steer um, the process and including considerations for implementation, for example, from the onset and throughout the planning so that when we do finalize the marine spatial plan, it can be implemented um, um, as we go. Excellent. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Wonderful. Now moving on to Ms. Gabriella. So how will the Department for Blue Economy ensure that there's a balance between economic activities and sustainability and upholding the integrity of, marine, of the marine environment, which can help us uphold ocean rights? So I'm pretty sure we have all heard the quote that says, perhaps too much of everything is as bad as too little. And we see many countries have either had too little conservation as compared to over-exploitation. But in the case of Seychelles, it's exemplary because we have a union between sustainability and economic diversification. And this is attained through our Seychelles um, Blue Economy Strategic Framework and Roadmap. And basically, this is a binding document that is a union between economic environment and social benefits. And in doing so, it's a holistic approach of all three elements. So one needs the other. You cannot leave one aside. 
So as we follow this, we have already mapped out different activities under our strategic roadmap. And we have this map that charters for the future. We have given the ocean more than just a voice, more than just a platform. We have given the ocean authority and its identity. We have given the ocean the right to say, listen, this is my zone. You can build here. This is a no-take zone. You can't build here. And this is why we see Seychelles is cutting edge. And this is why we are the champions of the blue economy. So back to you, Ms. Helena. The Ocean Race is working with experts around the world on ocean rights and seeing how ocean rights can help create a more level playing field for the ocean and raise the voice of the ocean as well. So do you think that the Seychelles Marine Spatial Plan helps in this movement towards ocean rights? Definitely. The Marine Spatial Plan um, is a tool to address ocean health, which in turn impacts human well-being. So through marine spatial planning, um, we can see that it's, 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 it's an important tool to allocate uh, different uses in the marine space to address any uh, conservation objectives that a country may have, but at the same time to ensure that there is a balance between the social and the economic opportunities of a country. You need to look at all the components as part of a puzzle. You know, the depth swap, the MSP, the blue bonds, the SECAT, the blue economy, all that are components of the same movement that has happened within the country. So, and when you put all of them together, they've created a momentum within the country whereby a number of people that never dream of ever having to do anything with the sea suddenly find themselves in the middle of activities and even leading certain activities that they had never dream of ever having to do with it. So in, create, in having this realization, we've seen that, um, for example, SICAT has now been um, instrumental in um, providing funds to a wide range of actors, be it individuals who are doing research, those who um, have started businesses but needed research um, to be done so that they really fully understand what is, what is the resource that they want to, um, to work on. Um, MSP has provided us with a clear plan of which areas should be protected and which areas should, that we can use. Now we know exactly which areas we should go. And at the same time, there are other research that are being done through help that we've received from other organizations that we are now mapping out the different um, resources that we have and where they are and how we're going to use them in the future. And the plans and the policies and all that are now in place. So we, we do have um, a clear platform for us to go to the next phase. This is where we are. And of course, consultation and, and participatory um, process is incredibly important. You need to bring people in for them to own the process and for them also to agree with you. If they don't, then they will fight you. And you don't want to have them on the other side. You want to bring them in the fold so that they help you and assist you in taking um, the whole process forward. Exactly, and everything that you've mentioned kind of proves the point that this is truly an ecosystem of different entities coming together to make this happen and make this momentum and wave of change move forward. And one of those components or identities are within that fold would be women. And happy Women's History Month, by the way, everyone. <laughs> Ms. Helena, you've been leading in ocean conservation for a number of years now, and, and we talk about women's leadership as being important, of course. But based on your own lived experience, how do you think it is in ocean conservation here in Seychelles, how is, it, how is it important? Why is it important? What I find is very important is yes, we do need very good science, but we also need to be able to communicate that science and translate that to uh, positive um, policy decision making. Um, and um, at the same time, it's equally important to build um, capacity with regards to ocean conservation and management, particularly for these small island developing states or large oceanic state or bosses <laughs> because um, we do have these large ocean areas to manage and often being the pillars of our economy also. And likewise, it's very important 
to share these lessons learned from women in leadership and conservation. Um, and Seychelles, you know, um, shines in that department through, for example, its Eco Schools program, which started in the early 90s. We, meant, uh, we heard earlier that, you know, um, environmental concerns are enshrined in our um, constitution. And so it's very important that at a very early age, the people of Seychelles understand that it's no, not only um, a gift to be able to be in a clean and you know a, a clean environment, but also a responsibility to help manage the area. So it's not just on the entities, um, you know, the protected area uh, management agencies to manage the ocean, but every person in the country has a, a role to play. Absolutely, influencing the next generation of leaders, making sure that girls feel empowered and knowing that they have a role to play, I think is critically important. And I love seeing that you, Miss Gabriella, you know, being so young and also having this influential role, it's it's phenomenal, right? The representation is here, and that's what I think young people need to see. They need to see examples of that. So, what's your personal experience been like as a young woman in ocean conservation? It's often said that the maritime industry is male dominant. In Seychelles, this is not the case. We've attained this balance, and it's amazing to see. As a young woman, not just in ocean conservation, but in ocean governance, it's always dynamic and it's different to, to always have these new and fresh ideas, to be able to bring something new. In fact, I, I believe women bring something new to any industry. But there is a lack of governance, um, especially with the youth and with females in this industry. So using my platform, my voice, my capabilities, and the resources that I do have access to, I do always encourage as much as possible. But definitely Seychelles is moving in the right step. We've included the youth, we've included women, and slowly but surely we are bridging the gaps, not just with policy, but with science. And every day we are one step closer to bridging that gap. Beautifully said, thank you very much. Would you like to all just maybe have a couple of final closing thoughts to share with the audience? We now have built a reputation internationally and that has attracted a number of partners that has come and joined us and wanted to, to be part of it. Um, and the original goal that we had set ourselves to raise money for uh, various activities, marine activities, we are very much now on that trajectory for us to be able to, to, to achieve it. The money is slowly coming in. It's not anymore that now we have to go and find it. It's, it's now coming to us. And, and it depends on, on the capacity that we have locally for us to be able um, to absorb it and for us to use it um, properly. We're at a very important stage right now where we are transitioning to implementation of this plan, and which is as equally important as was the zoning uh, phase. And I would just like to thank all the stakeholders and the people of Seychelles as we take this important step to transition to implementation of this marine spatial plan. We thank look you. forward to the implementation for sure. And thank you for all of your hard work on the marine spatial plan. Thank you. Awesome. And Gabriella? We, the small island developing states, or the big oceanic states, we've already done all that we can. And even if bigger countries are saying, oh, you're leading with example, you're leading with example, it's time to stop saying we are leading with example. We've done our bit. It's our world. It's your turn to do your bit. There is so much saving we can do, do your part. It's time to act, as the Ocean Summit has said. This is a, a platform for solutions, so don't just talk the talk. Walk the walk also. I love that. Perfect way to end this panel. Thank you all so much. Please give our panelists a round of applause.